Greetings and salutations. My name is that guy, this is the 28 House, and thank you for listening to Aim for the Top, an otaku's weekly sports review, where we bring together anime fans and sports fans in ways you never thought imaginable but now can't do without. We've got a big show for you here on episode number three. A lot of news to get to, a lot of uh, sports to cover. We'll talk a little basketball, some college football, some NFL. We'll take a quick look around the sports world, and we'll introduce a new, a brand spanking new segment. What that segment is going to be, well, I can't tell you now. You just have to listen to the podcast to see. That, folks, is what they call a tease in radio. Uh, This is not radio, but if it were, that would be quite the tease. Anyways, thanks again for listening. Uh, You can listen to us on Podbean, on YouTube when I uh, put up this episode. Soon to be on other podcasting platforms like uh, Google Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, um, Spotify, all that kind of stuff, Pandora. But uh, yeah, I can't give you the time frame exactly, but soon, my friends, soon. Anyways, okay, enough with the introductions. Let's get right into it. First... We're going to start with a little NBA talk. Now, there's th- this past week has just been a huge week of NBA news, of goings-on, of trades, of, gosh, uh, games canceled because of COVID, and I don't know. It's just been an incredible, big, exciting week for the NBA. So let's start there. All right, let's get to the biggest news, or what, or what I would call the biggest news for the NBA. It's finally happened. James Harden is no longer a Houston Rocket. He has been traded to the Brooklyn Nets in a four-team trade. So let's just go over all the players involved, all the draft picks, because, boy, are there a lot of draft picks involved. All right, so here's how it goes. Brooklyn gets James Harden. Very good. They they now have a big three, uh, (laughs) if they could ever get Kyrie, uh, wherever he is. So Brooklyn gets James Harden. Houston gets Victor Oladipo from the Indiana Pacers. They get Rodion's Kurutz from the Nets. They get Dante Exum. They get four unprotected first-round picks from Brooklyn. So Brooklyn's 2022, 2024, and 2026 first-round pick unprotected, meaning whatever it is, wherever the Nets finish, if they're bad and they get like a top-five pick, that pick is going to Houston. Um, so they get those picks, and they also get Milwaukee's um, first round unprotected in 2022. And then they get four unprotected first round pick swaps in 2021, 23, 25, and 27 from the Brooklyn Nets. Now those, they have the option of swapping spots with the Nets in those years in their first round pick. So that's what, so that's what Houston gets. That's uh, quite a lot. Cleveland, as the third team in this trade, they get Jarrett Allen. Indiana, the fourth team in this uh, trade, they get Karis LeVert and a 2023 second-round pick from Houston, which I'm just going to assume is unprotected, but it's a second-round pick, so it's probably not going to be worth that much. Anyways, all right, let's just start off by evaluating how each team kind of Kind of, kind of came out in this uh, whole, in this whole trade scenario. Let's start with Houston. So Houston, basically, this is obviously a move for the future. They're trading away their franchise centerpiece for a bunch of future first-round picks. They get back Victor Oladipo, but his contract is expiring after this year. So that means more money that they'll have in salary cap room. So, so basically, they're trying to. They're trying to rebuild the team. They tried winning with James Harden. They they paired him with Dwight Howard. They they paired him with Chris Paul. They paired him back again with uh, Russell Westbrook. None of those worked. So Houston is just rebooting. This gives them, with Oladipo's expiring contract, that gives them some salary cap flexibility in the future, and they get a ton of first-round draft picks that they can use, hopefully restock their team. Yeah, it's not great for the veteran players who are currently there, like uh, Eric Gordon, who, you know, want to win now. And 
obviously will probably be moved in the future or when their contracts are up they'll they won't be retained or they'll be traded away so for the youth movement that's that houston is soon to be undergoing it's a good trade and it's a very big haul um for a player because i mean think about what the pelicans got back for anthony davis they they didn't get near as many draft picks although they did get of course <clears throat> Lonzo Ball and Brandon Ingram, which are pretty good, <laughs> pretty good, very good players in the in the case of Brandon Ingram. But but yeah, Houston's trying to rebuild for the future. This is perfect for them. For the Brooklyn Nets, yes, they're giving up a ton of picks, um, but they get their third superstar to team up with Kevin Durant, and hopefully, I would imagine uh, all Nets fans they're definitely hoping for this for Kyrie Irving. Uh, Steve Nash is going to have a difficult job of finding enough, man, how, just, let, let's just, uh, let's just put it like this. Kyrie Irving and James Harden are definitely ball dominant guards. Um, <laughs> there's only one basketball. Um, there's only 48 minutes in the game per position. You have to divvy up minutes and players with the ball and shots and, and just running the offense. So it's going to be a really difficult job for Steve Nash in his first year as head coach. How he's going to get all this to work. But the Nets, they're they're in a win-now mode. That's why they got Kyrie. That's why they got Kevin Durant. Getting uh, James Harden still, when he's in shape and when he's motivated, he's you, you'd say he's still in his, in his prime. He was still in MVP form last year. Um so they get three all-star level, all-star cal- they they got three all-star caliber players, uh, two of whom you know are MVP caliber players when they're playing at their best. So Brooklyn got a lot better. Um, they're mortgaging their future. That's definitely for sure. Because um, trading away all those picks, you know, you would imagine at least some of those picks are going to be fairly high first round first round draft picks as the current players that the Nets have age, you know, the team just overall eventually eventually age catch, catches up to catches up to a team, they start to decline some. So some of those picks might be really valuable like say 5 years down the road, but Nets are trying to win now. Their timeline is trying to go for a championship, trying to com- to compete with Milwaukee and Boston and Philadelphia in the East. So I would say I would say overall yeah, it's a good trade if you can if you can get an MVP caliber player um to team up with your two uh, all-stars. Yeah, I would say that's a pretty good deal even if eventually the uh, bill is going to come due. So I think I think the Nets did good in this trade. All right, now to the Cleveland Cavaliers. How did they come out of this? So they sent a 2022 first-round pick that they actually got from the Bucks. So, you know, is it the Bucks pick? Is it Cleveland's pick? It's, eh, who cares? 2022 first-round pick, they send that to Houston. Uh, they also send guard Dante Exum. <laughs> Remember when he was supposed to be the big deal coming out uh, from Australia? Back when uh, the Jazz... Uh, drafted him way back I don't know five six years ago it's gonna be the next John Stockton Darren Williams perhaps Uh, anyways so they send him uh, to the Rockets and they also send a 2024 second round pick to the Brooklyn Nets which again second round picks tend to not be worth very much even if you don't even if you don't think Cleveland is going to be particularly good by then you know not making the playoffs even then uh, a a second round pick in the you know 30s low 40s it's not really a big deal anyway so they send that but in return they get Nets center Jared Allen and forward Torian Prince um, so for Cleveland uh, they get their center of the future Jared Allen he's a athletic uh, big man uh, from the University of Texas the great state my state of Texas um, and then Torian Prince who's I guess just kind of you know just there, trade filler. I guess you could say he's a, he's. I guess he's good enough to be a rotation player, you know. But he's, he, he's not going to be a star. But so Jared Allen, you know, that's pretty good. He's going to be their center. Although they do have Andre Drummond right now, who's just playing out of his mind. 
probably looking for his next contract, the next team that he's going to be on, because Cleveland will probably try. I would imagine either either to move him before the trade deadline, which I think got pushed back to like March, maybe this year, because it's usually in February, um, or they'll wait till next year when his contract, I believe, is expiring. So yeah, he's a short-term. He's their short-term center, and he's playing very well. But Jared Allen is a future. He's 22, 23, maybe. So young man, a lot of potential, athletic. Um, not not much of a uh, floor spacer, you would say, but definitely can move around, move his feet, uh, guard multiple positions. Not one of these slow, lumbering kind of centers like the Dallas Mavericks have, who I think should also be interested in a center like Andre Drummond, if they could get him. Anyways, so for Cleveland, uh, the fact that they're sending Dante Exum, who at this point... Uh, it's probably safe to say he's not really going to develop into anything other than maybe, you know, a bench player, a point guard off the bench. They send a first-round draft pick and a second-round draft pick, and they get their center of the future and some trade filler. So I would say they did okay. So the last team in this trade is the Indiana Pacers. Now they get Carr Slavert from the Nets, and they also get a 2023 second-round pick from the Houston Rockets. So for Indiana, um, Carr Slavert, he's basically all he does is score. He's a shooting guard, small forward, swing man, you would say. Yeah, the, he's, he just scores. He doesn't do a whole lot else. Um, and he's not a particularly efficient scorer. His two-point field, field goal percentage is three-point field goal percentage is true shooting. His effective field goal percent. Not the greatest of score, but he does go to a team that has, you know, I, I would say that they have a good young team in Indiana. They got uh, DeMontis Sabonis. They got Malcolm Brogdon. They got Miles Turner. They got TJ Warren. They, they've got some pretty good pieces there. They're currently 7-4. and four. They're fourth in the East. Um, they're trying to trying to get out of the uh, first round. And, you know, they've been to the playoffs quite a, a few times these past few years, but they just can't get out of the first round. They're kind of stuck with being first-round fodder, you would say, so they're trying to get out of that trap. And who knows, maybe Carr Slavert blossoms into efficient 20-point-per-game-plus score that he's shown flashes of uh, with the Nets. So I would say... Yeah, they give they give they give away Victor Oladipo, who's a very good player, but he was also coming off a quad tendon, a ruptured quad tendon, which just sounds like a horrible injury to come back from, especially for someone as athletic as him and who relied on his uh, explosive athleticism like Victor Oladipo did. And you know he was struggling some uh, this year, as you would expect coming back from such a severe injury. And, I mean, there had been talk that, you know, he kind of wanted out of Indiana anyways. So the fact that they were able to ship him um, and get a good young player in return who's not who's who's got two years, I think, left on his contract this year and next year for roughly $36, 37000000 million, something like that. So it's not unreasonable. Um, and he has room to grow. He's coming to a team that has a lot of talent, so he's, you know... Not going to be asked to be the the man, the main scorer, you know, create shots at clutch situations at the end of end of games, you know, high leverage situations. So uh, I would say it's a pretty good situation for him. So good for good for the Indiana Pacers. They give up something to get a little something. So uh, I, I like that for them. Um. So I guess for. For actually, for all the teams involved, I think they got something of value. Um, I think they, all four teams, kind of, we know what they were trying to do with this trade. For Houston, it's going young. For Brook, for Brooklyn, it's win now. For Indiana, it's get back a useful, still in his 20s, in his prime uh, player. Um, for the Cavaliers, get two young players, one of whom is going to be your center of the future going forward. So I would say all the teams, they they met their, obje- they met their objectives. This was a good trade 
for each of them. It's just a matter of of really uh, how good the Nets are going to be going forward is going to determine the value of the va- of the draft picks that they're going to give to Houston. Because you know, hey, if they're still good, if they say Kevin Durant, he resigns with the Nets and he's still here, you know, still with Brooklyn in 2025, 2026, and you know they're still playing well. Maybe they're not a championship level team, but if they're a playoff team, then. You know, the value of those first-round picks isn't so great. But if he's not on the team, if Kyrie leaves, if um, James Harden leaves, and um, the Nets aren't very good and they have to give away first-round picks, ooh boy, they could be in some trouble for a while. So we'll wait to see how that turns out. But um, let's uh, take a little deeper dive into the nets and hey what the heck is happening to Kyrie Irving is he on the team does he want to play is he doing something else is he breaking COVID protocols who knows so yeah he hasn't been with the nets for what over a week he's missed uh, multiple games his coach doesn't know where he went doesn't know where he is his GM doesn't know where he is uh He's, he hasn't contacted his employer. Uh, he's shown up in pictures at a family party, not wearing a mask. Is he is he helping on, the, uh, what is it, a, a politician in New York's campaign, I believe? Like they're running for, oh gosh, was it like attorney general or something? Is, I don't know. He, but, okay, so he's getting involved with political activism. That's fine, but uh, he is getting paid to play with the Brooklyn Nets, so he might want to show up for his job because... He's making a lot of money, and they kind of depend on him. But um, but even but even if he comes back, we I guess we'll have to wait to see because you know there's pictures of him at a apparently a family party, multiple family parties in fact. Um, and he wasn't wearing a mask. Uh, yeah, that's NBA. NBA doesn't like that, especially with how the NBA's had to crack down recently on their COVID protocols, making them more stricter since they had to cancel game. Cancel games for a couple days straight there. Uh, yeah, that's that's definitely not a good look for Kyrie. Um, if you're, I mean, if you're a Nets fan, I I don't even know what you're thinking right now because you know, you know if you ha- if you can get all your three stars playing together, and, and get your rotation worked out and get some team chemistry, you know this is a really talented team. Kevin Durant doesn't look like he's lost much of his step coming off his injuries. I suppose we should say injuries since he pretty much, what, he got injured last year and then he re-injured himself pretty much right away after he came back. So, yeah, let's just say Kevin Durant coming back from his multiple injuries that last season with Golden State. Um, so, yeah, they know they have a really good team. They're in win-now mode. The East, you know, everyone's, I'm sure, going to say it's going to be... Boston or Milwaukee and maybe the Sixers and maybe perhaps the Nets but if they can get if they have all three guys playing me personally I'll take I'll take the Nets get out of the East I'll take Kevin Durant over I'll take Kevin Durant over uh Giannis any day of the week even though sure maybe Giannis is a better overall player because he adds more defensively but Kevin Durant's got a unique unicorn-like offensive skills that um, don't come around very often. He's a generational talent, and (laughs) throw him with uh, James Harden and Kyrie Irving, that's a pretty good team. All of this is a way to say net fans must be, like, just ripping their hair out, just wanting to know why Kyrie is doing this, why isn't he showing up, why can't he at least tell the team where he is when he's going to come back. Put Steve Nash in a really difficult spot. This is his first year. He's <laughs> learning how to become an NBA coach, and what he has to deal with as a player just saying, see ya, like <laughs> one week into the season. So very difficult for Steve Nash. Hoping the best for him because he is a former Dallas Maverick. Um, so I'm always sentimental about my Mavericks and former Mavericks. Anyways, so the Nets, hopefully they can figure that out. Although I did find it interesting that their GM, Sean Marks, um, and this is in reporting from ESPN today, um, in some comments, he, he mentioned that Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving were both, you know, they're both supportive of this trade to go get James Harden. But he, but in his comments, like, he didn't really clarify, um, like, 
wh- when did Kyrie like when was he supportive of this you know proposed proposed trade because I'm just going to assume they've been working on this trade for a number of weeks um, it wasn't just something you know split of the moment kind of thing so when exactly is did Kyrie say that? Was it recently? So does that mean has he contacted Sean Marks just about the James Harden trade, or has he told him anything else, like where he is or when he's coming back? Or yeah, it's just uh, kind of strange, just uncertain the the exact time frame that uh, Sean Marks was talking about when he when he said that Kyrie and Katie were supportive of that trade. Um, anyways, hopefully, I you know. The Nets getting back would be good for the league because who doesn't love superstars doing their thing, putting up amazing shots, uh, entertaining, doing all that. But, uh, yeah, he's really kind of sabotaging his career. And who knows what could uh, what could happen, you know, could, he, could the Nets, like, void his contract by, you know, saying, well, he's, he's not showing up, he's not doing his job. Um, yeah, he's done. We're, we're parting ways with him. Uh, who knows? It remains to be seen. That the whole thing is just a mess for the Nets and for the NBA to try and figure out what's going on. But uh, hopefully, Kyrie rejoins the Nets and we get to see the best version of the Nets because I really do believe that they're going to contend for the East title. And all three of them on that team, on on a team uh, playing well, playing with some uh, cohesion, some stability. Yeah, give me the Nets. All right, we turn from the Eastern Conference to the Western Conference. Uh, let's uh, check in with my Dallas Mavericks. Kristaps Porzingis has finally returned. So uh, yesterday, because I'm recording this on Thursday, January 14th, uh, the Mavericks beat the Hornets. We got revenge on them. Yes, revenge was what we were going after. Uh, Mavericks beat the Hornets 104-93 to and. Yeah, it kind of wasn't that close. I mean, they were up by 17 at halftime. Yeah, the the game was over at halftime. The you know the Hornets chipped away mostly in the fourth quarter when they didn't really care, when the Mavs didn't really care. You know, easy win. Luca had another near triple double. He was 34 points, uh, 13 rebounds, nine assists. KP um, played 21 minutes, I believe. Uh, he shot 6 of 16 for 16 points. He was 4 of 9 from 3-pointers. Uh, he didn't rebound very well. He only got like 4 rebounds, but that's okay. Uh, Willie Cauley-Stein and, uh, and Luca rebounded rebounded for him. Um, so yeah, it was, a, it was a good performance by KP. Nice to see him at least shooting wise, looking like himself, uh, being able to shoot off the dribble, you know, to catch and shoot, do all, do a variety of offensive, you know, uses offensive uh, weapons he has, so showing his versatility. So it was good to see KP back. Doesn't look like um, he's showing any ill effects from that knee injury that he had and the surgery he had in the off season. Uh, I would I would assume going forward, Rick Carlisle's. Rick Carlisle, oh boy, it's hard to say, Rick Rick Carlisle, Carlisle, hard to say, uh, yeah, I would imagine Ricky, um, he's gonna, he's gonna slowly ease KP, uh, you know, back into games, I, I don't imagine for the regular season, uh, you know, I don't, I don't imagine they want it, they want him averaging, say, more than about 30 minutes per game, and who knows, they might even want less just to save him, um, so yeah, it, it's good to have him back. Um, good to see him back in the rhythm of things. Hopefully, he can get he gets into a good good rhythm offensively and def- and defensively because he's a very good uh, defender. Um, and the Mavericks will definitely need him if they're going to improve their defense, which was a huge problem last year and particularly in the playoffs. Um, so yeah, it'll be important to to get KP back and rolling and. If the Mavericks want to try and get out of the first round, which they haven't been out of the first round since 2011, oh, what a year that was! Yeah, if they want to, if they want to, if they want to get a top four seed and move it and move out of the first round, yeah, they're definitely going to need KP playing it close to his best. So to recap, a uh, good win for the Mavs. They improved to six and four. They're in sixth in the West. They got a game coming up against the Milwaukee Bucks. That should be very interesting. Very fun to watch. 
So yeah, I'm feeling pretty optimistic um, about the season going forward. So that is the Mavs report. Um, now let's go to another team in the West who maybe is a bit of a surprise. They didn't make the playoffs last season, but I imagine they were hoping that they'd at least be in the playoff mix or in the mix for that uh, for the uh, play-in spot, you know, as the ninth seed. Um and that team is the San Antonio Spurs. Yes, the team uh, just down a down a couple out. Well, more than a couple hours from from the DFW area. Uh, more like five hours to San Antonio. But yeah, just just down a thirty five. Let's say um, the San Antonio Spurs. Yes, they currently sit at uh, seventh in the West. They're six and five. Um, they've they've been in interesting team i guess you would say they have some they have some good wins they have wins against the lakers against the clippers and then the thunder who are surprisingly you know hanging in there uh but they also have some losses to minnesota and new orleans and that's not so great um they have won four of their last five which is nice but when you when you look at some of their team ratings, they're you know they're not they're not all that great. So they're 18th in offensive rating, and and that's just a measure of how many points they score per 100 possessions. So they're 18th in that. They're 16th in defensive rating, which is how many points you allow per 100 possessions. Um, and then net rating is just your offensive rating minus your defensive rating. They're 17th in that. So you know th- that's not great. Um, they're in the bottom third of the league in the number of three points that three point uh, shots that they attempt and in field goal percentage. Although they do shoot the three point uh, shot pretty well, it's just they don't take a lot of them, uh, and that's in large part due to because <laughs> Demar Derozan does not take a lot of threes, um, and he and he's their he's their top scorer. He, he takes the most shots. Um, they're actually. Um, their turnover percentage. So the uh, there's a stat. It's the estimated number of uh, percentage of turnovers a team commits um, in a hundred possessions. So they that's the turnover percentage. Um, they're actually first in the league at that. So they're very good at protecting the ball. Um, they're also in top ten on um, opponent free throws. So in other words, they don't send the other the other team to the foul line all that much. They're they're in the top ten of that, which is that's a nice side. That means they're not getting in a bunch of foul trouble giving giving teams easy points. So that's good. And also as a team their their net rating is actually negative point nine, if you can believe that. They got a <laughs> they got a negative uh, net rating and yet they still have a winning record. That's interesting. Um actually uh, and there's a there's a there's a metric called expected wins, which maybe in another in another segment we can go over that. But um, yeah, it's just a prediction of how much uh, of how many wins a, a team is predicted to have based on based on how many points they give up and how many points they score. Anyways, based on that, they they would be predicted to be five and six, so they're six and five, so which is one game ahead, and they're actually playing the uh, Houston Rockets right now. And the last time I checked, they were leading the game. So hey, maybe they'll move to seven and five. So good for them. Anyways, my point is some of the some of the stats with the Spurs they're kind of not so great, but hey, they're seventh in the West. They're firmly in the playoffs, having a good start to the season. Uh, Demar Derozan is playing very well. Um, he's averaging twenty one point two points, seven assists. That's pretty impressive. Uh, he's shooting forty nine percent on his field goals. Um, he, he is shooting thirty nine percent on three pointers, although he doesn't take very many per game. Uh, he's got a sixty percent true shooting. Uh, right, which takes into account two pointers, three pointers, and free throws, um, and he's posting a very nice twenty-three point four uh, player efficiency rating, uh, also called PER, which we might get into in another segment. I'm not promising anything. I'm just suggesting maybe we can get into what that is. Uh, in other words, but uh, for now, twenty-three point four. That's very good. That is all star. That's all star caliber. Uh, player efficiency. So very good. Very good for DeMar Rosen. Uh, gosh, he's guy. He's been in the league for a long time. He's 31 years old at a USC old man doing his thing. I like, I like seeing, I like seeing the veterans still showing that they got something left in the tank. So that's good. Um, and as a team, they, they actually do have kind of a good mix of young players and old players. So they got, 
you know, DeRozan. They got they still have LaMarcus Aldridge. Uh, they got Patty Mills, but they're also working in some young players. So they got um, they got Dejounte, or is it Dejounte, or is it Dejounte? I I'm still not sure how his name is pronounced. But Spurs fan, Spurs fans, if you know how Dejounte Murray's first name is pronounced, please tell me. They got Lonnie Walker. They got Keldon Johnson. They got their first round pick from this year, uh, Devin Vassell. Uh, they got Jakob Pötl, big man from Austria. Came out of uh, Utah, played college at Utah. They got him. Uh, oh, they also have Rudy Gay. There's another uh, important veteran contributor for them. So, so they have a good mix of old and young players making good contributions, although so, some of the younger players uh, might want. Yeah, they're hoping they'll develop into a little more efficient of players. But anyways, I would say the Spurs are having a pretty good start to the season. Um, although it is early, you know, it's after after tonight's game, it'll only be 12 games into the season. So um, I think with the Spurs, some things looking forward that will be, you know, trends if to see if they can still continue. So first it would be, can DeMar DeRozan still play at this level, um, all-star caliber level? And also Patty Mills. He's really efficient. He's shooting great, as usual, from three-pointers. Yeah, they're... Can DeMar DeRozan and Patty Mills keep doing what they're doing throughout this entire season? Uh, that'll be something looking to going forward. Uh, DeJounte Murray, can he improve his shooting? Because uh, it's not so great. Uh, his outside shooting is from three-pointers, from... Um, mid-range and almost three-point uh, range. The long, Let's just call them the longer two-point shots, which uh, incidentally tend to be the most inefficient shots. Uh, but And he does take some of those. So if he can improve his shooting from there, and uh, probably more so if he can just improve his three-point shooting a little bit, th- that would help them a lot. Um, because he does do other things well. He's He's... He's cut down on his turnovers. He's increased his scoring. He's he's doing some good things. He's a he's a good young player, you would say. But if they if he can improve his his shooting just a little bit, that would go a long way. Ah, uh, yeah. So, ooh, for an interesting factoid about the Spurs, check this out. So, um, compared to all their division opponents, so that would be um, let's see, the Mavericks, the Spurs. Uh, the Pelicans and the Grizzlies. Um, the Spurs have the have a five man lineup that has the best net rating, and that lineup is uh, Dejounte Murray, Jakob Pertl, Rudy Gay, Patty Mills, and Devin Vassell. So they have those five players when they're on the court together. And <laughs> thing about this is they've only played thirty two. 32.9 minutes, so that's not very much time. That's uh, three minutes a game, roughly. Uh, they have a net rating of 38.9. Very impressive, although the the thing about net, net rating like that is that it doesn't take into account who they're going up against. So if, if that lineup is going up against other teams, you know, bench players that's not quite as valuable as if they were going up against the other team's starters. So there you go, there's your uh, factoid, your little nugget of knowledge about the San Antonio Spurs, whom we will have to watch going forward to see how this season turns out for them. And with that, I think we can leave the world of the NBA, and we turn next to the world of college football. Yes, college football. Uh, the final game of the season, Alabama, Ohio State, uh, for the college football championship uh, at the Orange Bowl uh, down there in uh, Florida. It's the, uh, yes, the the season finale of the college football season. This is it. There's no OVA on the way. <laughs> this is it. Did that game deliver up to the expectations? Well, I don't know. Myself, I was hoping for a bit of a closer game, a bit of a more competitive game. Um, I thought with all the with all the offensive talent that uh, Ohio State had, they'd able they'd be able to keep the game a little bit closer. But um, basically, things didn't start well 
for Ohio State, and they just got worse as the game wore on. Um, yeah, so Alabama defeats Ohio State uh, 52 to 24. They blew him out, beat him by 28 points. Uh, Devontae Smith proved that uh, he is definitely the best player in college football as he had 12 receptions on 15 targets. That's very nice. Uh, 215 yards, three touchdowns, and, and that was all in the first half because he he injured himself at some point uh, in the first half, and he pretty much didn't play the rest of the uh, second half. Um, there was a particularly <laughs> hilarious moment when uh, linebacker uh, Ohio State linebacker Tough Borland, which is a really great name for a linebacker. I mean, uh, that's just a great name, and I think it would also be a good name for... Um, a video game character in a fighting game or for an anime character and, you know, like a martial arts or, or some kind, some kind of, yeah, martial arts kind of anime. I think, I think Tough Borland would re- would be a really great name. Anyways, yeah, there's a hilarious moment where, um, on one of Devonta Smith's touchdowns, Tough Borland was trying to cover him. That did not go well. Um, let's see, Najee Harris, he had two touchdowns, um, he was very effective in the passing game, uh, he had a nice, he had a nice, uh, one particular catch that I'm thinking of that led to a touchdown, uh, in the first half on a, kind of a, kind of a screen play that he just kind of, it, it wasn't exactly a wheel route, but it, it kind of looked like one. Anyways, he was very good, he was very good, very effective in the passing game, um, Jalen Waddle came back from injury after fracturing his ankle. He did not look so good, and people were wondering why was he out there because he clearly wasn't himself. Uh, he hobbled off, I think, a couple times in the first half. Um, one play in particular, after he, made, after he made a reception and ran out of bounds, he did not look right. But he he tried to fight through. He tried to play the game, but um, yeah, I think eventually they shut him down. But they didn't need him at all. They had. They had they had other they had other stars step up. Um, John Minchie, another one of their uh, soon to be stud wide receivers, who's probably going to lead them in receiving yards next season if he comes back. Yeah, he he had oh gosh like eighty or ninety yards receiving. Uh, Mac Jones probably in his final game as a uh, Crimson Tide. He was thirty six forty five for four hundred sixty four yards and five touchdowns. The the Bama office the Bama offense posted 624 total yards. Um, they completely dominated the time of, uh, time of possession. They had the ball for 37 and a half minutes to 22 and a half for uh, Ohio State. That is just wow. That is not giving your opponent very many chances to uh, turn that score around. Um, yeah, it was just a dominant performance by the Alabama offense, which. You know, I'm sure we all expect them to do very well, but maybe maybe we expected Ohio State to do a little better just based on the fact that they were able to uh, to contain um, Clemson. I mean, Clemson did put up a lot of yards, but not so much in points. So a little bit of a disappointing performance by the Ohio, by the Ohio State defense. Um, but really, the the story for Ohio State was that Justin Fields did not look right. He was dealing with a hip injury uh, that he suffered in the game against Clemson. He did not look himself. He did not appear to want to to get out of the pocket to try and pick up yards with his feet. To, yeah, do anything like that, you know. Um, and a lot of his value, of course, comes from you know his versatility, running running with the ball when he has to, or just making plays with his feet, extending plays, you know, when there's pressure and. But also, you know, keeping his eyes downfield and being able to make good throws. But, um, yeah, he just did not look himself. Um, Ohio State, you know, they had they did okay offensively in the first half, but they only had 17 points. Um, and they also punted four times. And three three of those drives, they, they, they had three and outs. So, you know, that's just, that's just putting your defense in a bad position because you know Alabama is the best offense in college football and – Going three and out three times, that's just creating a lot of stress on your defense to come up with plays, to make stops. That even even on those drives, if Ohio State, you know, hadn't scored, but if they could have, 
if they could have given their defense a little more rest, if they could have extended those drives just a little bit, not, not necessarily getting points, but just you know six or seven play drives, maybe, maybe that would have uh, contributed to their defense being a little fresher and playing a little better. But uh, that's not how it worked out because uh, <laughs> yeah, everything just went wrong for Ohio State in the, in the first half. Trey Sermon injured on the first play. Uh, that the Ohio State offense ran. He got walloped. Um, I forget by whom. Um, anyways, he, yeah, walloped out with some kind of some kind of injury. I think it was like shoulder, something like that. Maybe maybe separated his shoulder. I didn't I, I didn't look up to see what exactly it was, but yeah, looked like it hurt quite a bit. Um, Alabama defense was pretty impressive. Uh, Christian Barmore, um, had five tackles, two tackles for loss, a sack. Uh, Patrick Sertan, the second, had uh, two tackles, one pass defense, and uh, one tackle for loss. And, um, yeah, they limited Ohio State to just to 341 yards, which is a very good day by the Alabama defense. So, basically, this was a dominating performance by the best team in college football by far. Um they were only tested in two games this whole season, that, that SEC championship against Florida, and then, surprisingly, Ole Miss, um, led by uh, Lane Kiffin. The, uh, I, guess, I guess you could call Lane Kiffin an offensive guru. I'm, uh, I'm still not sure how great of a, just an overall coach he is. I mean, he did, he did okay at Florida International. Um, not so good at Tennessee and USC, but... Um, that's nice what he did at Ole Miss this year, going 5-5, five and five, winning the bowl game. Anyways, Bama, yeah, they were only tested twice in this season. Um, and, that was a, and that was a really good Florida team who had everyone that they went up against. So clearly Alabama was the best team. I don't feel quite so bad about a losing by 28 points to Alabama when they had Jalen Waddell in the second game of the season. So yes, congratulations to Alabama, another national championship for Nick Saban, his sixth with the Alabama Crimson Tide, his seventh overall. Um, he won he won the uh, 2003 championship with LSU <laughs> in quite a different manner than he did with this Alabama team. That was he was all defense back in those days with Saban, and back when he was at Michigan State, and um. Yeah, just, um, I don't know about you, but I'm just kind of <laughs> sick of Alabama winning all of these, <laughs> all these championships, always winning the, the SEC, always winning the SEC West. I would like a and <laughs> maybe once in my lifetime to win an SEC West division title. That would be great. But um, yeah, it's, I don't know. And, and I mean, really, when you... <laughs> Just based on their recruiting alone, Alabama is going to be just as potent years down the road so long as Nick Saban is there. Um, just looking at some of their recruiting rankings, um, and this is from 24-7 Sports. They're like recruiting rankings, and it's a good one because it, because it, uh, for one, it uses uh, recruiting rankings from like several sources. So it doesn't just rely on, you know, the ESPN, their recruiting rankings or rivals or something. Uh, it puts them all together. Anyways, so the 2018 class and who would be seniors um, this coming up football college football season, the 2021 football college football season, they rated Alabama number five um, with two five-star players. And, and keep in mind, uh, for 24-7 sports, each year they rate, they rate 32 prospects as five stars. So, a sixteenth, a sixteenth of the uh, of all the five star recruits are going to one school. That's um, out of one hundred twenty some odd Division one schools. In the twenty nineteen class, they have Alabama ranked as the number one class with three five stars. So that's uh, an eleventh, roughly. For the 2020 class, they have Alabama ranked number two with four five stars. So that's very impressive. That is uh, an eighth, 12.5% 12, 12 
of all the five star players, uh, recruits, or went to Alabama. And in 2021, so this signing class uh, that they just that they just made, Alabama was number one. I'm sure you did not see that coming. They're number one. They have seven five stars. So 20 percent, one fifth of all the five star recruits that 24/7 Sports has rated. One-fifth of them are going to one team, and that one team is Alabama. So, in other words, Alabama's dominance will continue at least through, oh, I don't know, 2023, 2024. And that's assuming, and and probably beyond, again, this all really depends on when Saban decides that he's tired of kicking everyone's butt, which hopefully will be soon. And actually, this goes into a, and as this go this goes into a like a, a kind of a bigger point that I've read in some read in some articles like on Yahoo and ESPN, and basically it's just is the dominance by Alabama and a few other teams in the college football playoff, um, is their dominance a bad thing for the sport? Because one thing about college football, I guess that fans like, is that the feeling that anything can happen, that there's going to be crazy upsets, that every team has a chance, that there's more there's more possibility for an upset, even for the good teams than there is in the NFL. Although the although the level of competition is obviously much closer in the in the uh, in the NFL. So the worst team in the NFL is much closer to the best team than the worst team in college football is to the best team. So like uh, University of Connecticut, they're nowhere near Alabama. While the Bengals, or oh, the, the Jags, the Jags, they're, they're the worst team. They're the worst team. They're a lot, uh, they're a lot closer um, to the Chiefs than UConn is to Bama. But anyways, is, anyways, is the domination of the college football playoff by a handful of... Um, some of the best some of the best teams in college football these historical historically good programs although maybe not so much for Clemson um, anyways is the domination by by a relatively select uh, elite teams is that ruining college football by making everyone else feel like well their season doesn't mean anything the bowl games they don't really mean anything if they don't get to the college football playoff, their season was for nothing. So we see a lot more players skipping their bowl games, um, going into the NFL, these types of, of things. Um, and also, are, th- are these teams that are getting into the college football playoff, is their advantage over the other teams increasing? Because the fact that they can get into that they've gotten into the playoffs in the past makes them more. Uh, makes them more attractive to recruits to want to go to because hey, what's what's the best way to uh, you know perform on the big stage? Get drafted in the NF- get drafted in the NFL. Well, it's playing at one of the elite programs that are playing in the biggest games in the college football playoffs, um, which is actually kind of a topic I wanna I wanna kind of research see if I can see if, see if I can come up for with some kind of answer to that. But um, that is a project for another day. Anyways, my point is. Is it bad for college football that just a few teams feel like they have a true chance at the playoffs? Because with the way the playoffs are set up, since um, the Power Five conferences, not every conference, you know, there's no there's no automatic bid for the Power Five conference winners. Uh, the Group of Five, so the conferences like the American Athletic Conference, the Conference USA, the Sun Belt, since they don't have an automatic bid for even one of their teams. Um, yeah, it's just four teams that the committee selects. Um, yeah, is is that process, is that leading to, for one, co- making college football more of a regional sport? So regional as in the, the regions that are going to the playoffs. So kind of the South and the, and the Midwest and, you know, the whole rest of the country. Uh, college football, does it mean less? Is it is it becoming devalued? Um, it's an interesting argument. <laughs> I am agnostic as to whether it's true, but I, I do think it's worth considering. And, and to be honest, I do hope that the that eventually the college football playoff moves to eight teams. That's all I'm asking for. An automatic bid for 
each of the Power Five conferences, one automatic bid for the Group of Five, and then you have your two two wild cards that the playoff committee can select any way they want. If they can give us that, I would be satisfied with that. I I think that would be a, a good compromise between wanting to keep keep the football the college football playoff elite, so you're getting quality teams. We don't want to let some teams that aren't that aren't quite so high quality into the playoff. I can understand that. But we also want to keep all the other conferences feeling like they have a true shot at the playoff. So that's what I think. But um, is Alabama's dominance <laughs> bad? You know, is Clemson's dominance bad? Is Ohio State's dominance bad? I don't know. It's hard to say. Uh, I'll leave that to you, the audience, to decide for – the uh, football intelligentsia for them to uh, write about and consider and all those sorts of things. But I just thought I'd throw it out there as an interesting talking point as a way to uh, get the conversation going. So, And finally, the last AP poll of the season was released. And um, even though the poll itself doesn't matter because we already know that uh, Alabama beat Ohio State and <laughs> everyone else, how they finish, that doesn't matter one thing. However... I am pleased that my Aggies finished fourth in the AP poll, uh, the final AP poll, which is their highest um, their highest ranking uh, in the final AP poll since 1939. Although I suppose there's a certain element of a you know, let's say a participation trophy kind of feel, the celebrating a, a fourth place finish in the AP poll, a, a certain uh, Lisa Simpson. I have a ball, perhaps you would like to bounce it uh, kind of feel. Still, it's our highest ranking since 1939. We had a 9-1 and season in the SEC. We won a ball game. I'm happy to finish fourth, even though we didn't get in the playoffs. So, thank you to the AP for voting the Texas A&M Aggies fourth in this year's final AP poll. All right, let's quickly get to some... Uh, news stories around the college football world. First in Michigan, uh, John Harbaugh, I'm sorry, not John Harbaugh, Jim Harbaugh, uh, signed a new four-year extension uh, with Michigan that is going to pay him $4 million per year as his base salary, but there's a lot of incentives uh, that can push up his salary a lot higher. So he'll get bonuses for division title, conference title, a New Year's Six berth, and a college football playoff berth. So uh, that seems, you know, kind of, I, I think that's a reasonable kind of contract. Um, he's done well at Michigan. I mean, if you look at his, if you look at his record, it's, it's pretty good. He's, he's gotten to a couple big bowl games. He got to the Peach Bowl and he's got to the Orange Bowl. Um, one, he lost Florida State. The other, he destroyed Florida. Um, yes, he hasn't met expectations. He has yet to beat Ohio State or win the division or win the conference, but he hasn't been bad, but he shouldn't be paid like he's the best coach in the Big Ten unless he can perform like he's the best coach in the Big Ten, in which case Michigan is going to win the conference, in which case those incentives will push, it, push his salary way up. So this seems like a reasonable extension uh, I would think more athletic directors and uh, athletic departments would want to sign these kind of de- sign their coaches to these kind of deals rather than just extend them, you know, four or five years in advance with huge money and um, just hoping for the best. And when things don't go right, then uh, they have to fire the coach and pay him off a huge amount of money, like what Texas did with uh, Tom Herman. So who knows? Maybe. Uh, Athletic directors will wisen up. Anyways, all right, on to, well, actually back to Alabama. So they hired a new offensive coordinator after losing Steve Sarkeesian. They get Bill O'Brien. Yes, Bill O'Brien, fresh off a, uh, uh, well, a disastrous tenure as the Texans' GM, acting GM, but not so bad as the head coach. But anyways, Bill O'Brien will be the latest in a series of, uh, uh, failed he- head coaches to try and rehabilitate their coaching career with Alabama. So he'll be their offensive coordinator for next season. Uh, Rich Rodriguez, the, uh, well, I guess you could say disgraced former uh, Arizona head football coach, 
Uh, he was hired as offensive coordinator at U- University of Louisiana Monroe by a uh, new coach, Terry Bowden. So that'll be interesting to see because Rich Rod, hey, back in the day, he was he was quite he, he was quite the uh, hot commodity in the coaching world there in the mid to late 2000s with uh, West Virginia, and eventually he got to Michigan because of it, and he failed hard. Anyway, so Rich Rod is back in college football, so I guess hooray for him, although given the circumstances that he was fired from Arizona, uh, you you might not feel so great about that. With that aside, I think we can say to the college football season, see you, Space Cowboy. Moving on, finally, to the week that was in the NFL and the Super Wild Card Weekend. All right, but before we talk playoffs, let's talk about some coaching news going on. First up, the Jags finally got their man. They hire Urban Meyer, uh, fresh off uh, doing college football work for Fox. He is the new Jaguars head coach. Um, Obviously, don't need to go into how great his uh, track record is as a college coach, but will he have success as an NFL coach? Who knows? Is he going to be like Jimmy Johnson, Bill Walsh, uh, Jim Harbaugh, you know? Those are college coaches, college coaches that had success there, and then they went on to have NFL success. Or is he going to be more like Steve Spurrier or uh, Nick? I will not be the coach at Alabama. Saban, who in their stints in the NFL did uh, not quite so good. So it's an interesting hire by the Jags. It's definitely a splash hire, and it's also pretty cool that they get the first overall pick, and they're almost certainly going to pick Trevor Lawrence. So it'll be. Interesting to see what Urban Meyer can do with Trevor Lawrence. Next, the Eagles fired Doug Peterson, which is um, very unkind of him after he, uh, you know, took the effort to sabotage that last game for them in order in order to preserve their draft position. Uh, It's very very unthoughtful of them, but apparently there was, I guess, behind the scenes some uh, tension between the front office and. And uh, Doug Peterson concerning uh, Carson Wentz and uh, Peterson's staff. So, yeah, it was just a bad situation all around. Doug Peterson, he is gone three years after leading the Eagles to a Super Bowl. Um, Dan Campbell, maybe to the Lions. It's being reported that I I guess they're considering him. I don't know if they've met with him yet, but uh, his name has been tossed out there as potentially being... Being a, one of the leading candidates, um, he was an interim head coach for Miami um, when Joe Philbin uh, got fired, and I don't remember what year this was, I think maybe 20, somewhere, 2013, 14, maybe 15, somewhere around there. Um, he was the interim coach, he went 5-7, and seven, so not so great there, but um, long-time NFL player, played few seasons for Dallas, actually, three seasons. And he's from Texas A&M, so of course I have to um, be overly optimistic on his chances as being a quality head coach. So, um, yeah, maybe the Lions are going to go with Dan Campbell or maybe they'll go somewhere else. We'll see. Uh, But the Jets, yes, the New York Jets have hired Robert Sala, the defensive coordinator from the 49ers, to be their new head coach to... Lead them in to what will certainly be a sparkling future behind the arm of Sam Darnold. <laughs> Possibly, we'll see what they do with that. So yeah, congratulations to the Jets. You have a you have a head coach. Good for you. All right, got that out of the way. With now, let's go to the games. So let's start with uh, let's just go in the order of, that the games happen. So let's go Saturday's first game. We'll go Bills with Colts. Bills eke out a victory, uh, 27-24, Josh Allen. Uh, yes, he was very impressive in, in what was his second playoff game, his, his first playoff game last season. He was kind of kind of a little bit wild some of the time. But this game is, is great, 26 30 of 35 for 324 yards, uh, three touchdowns, one with his legs. He was also <laughs> the Bills' leading rusher with 54 yards. Um, Stephon Diggs did his thing. He had six receptions, 128 yards, a touchdown, yeah. Bill's offense, once they got rolling, it it did it, it took him about <laughs> about a quarter or so to actually start getting rolling. But um, after that big uh, drive at the end of the first half, where they where there's what there's less than two minutes left, they just stopped Indy um, from conver- 
from converting on fourth and goal. And, yeah, they went down and went, got a touchdown. Yeah, from that point, the Bills' offense was rolling. I really think the story of this game was more about what the Colts didn't do. Um, you know, Rivers, he was he was pretty good. He was 27 of 46. He had 309 yards. He had two TDs. He didn't get sacked, which is which is nice for a quarterback who doesn't have much mobility. Um, but the one one thing is that he didn't really push the ball down the field that much. He only averaged 6.7 yards yards in attempt. Uh, just looking at his passing chart, there's just a few uh, long shots that were taken. Um, uh, TD to the tight end Jack Doyle, that was nice. But yeah, just a lot of short stuff stuff inside the numbers, as you would, as as they say. Um, yeah, just kind of a kind of a conservative kind of passing game plan um, by the Colts, and and then of course there were some of the decisions. So the decision at the uh, at the end of the, uh, the end of the first half. So they had it, you know, first and goal, um, and they couldn't punch it in. They you know they had the opportunity. It was it was fourth and goal. They could have kicked the field goal. Um, but they elected to go for to go for it on fourth and goal, and they did not convert um, in, on an incomplete pass. Obviously, people are going to that. That's been the one decision that's been uh, much discussed. Um, also, seeing as being a turning point in the game, as giving the Bills a lot of momentum. If you're one of those people who uh, believe in momentum in sports. <laughs> I, uh, I'm, I'm, let's say I'm 60-40, like, leaning towards momentum being a thing. I I think it's kind of one of those things that's hard to, um, hard to define, hard to quantify, um, and, and some, um, from certain perspectives you would call, um, you would call momentum an unobservable, um, variable, so it's a variable that we that we think uh, influences other variables, like for instance how how a team performs, how uh, their ability to win a game, to come back in a game that they're losing, uh, stuff like that. It's one of those things that uh, we think exists and affects other things, but we're just not sure how to measure it. So therefore, it's uh, called an unobservable variable. Anyways, myself, I like going for it on fourth down. The Colts have a good running game. Um, they've had that all year. They did pretty. They did pretty well against the Bills that game. So, although they didn't, they didn't try to run it on fourth down. Um, regardless, yeah, I like the decision. Put it in your. Put it in your QB's hands to make a play. Uh, Philip Rivers, he's, I was about to say your Hall of Fame QB, but uh, I don't think he'll, he'll get into the Hall of Fame. I mean, he, he certainly has the stats to get into the Hall of Fame, but part of the deal with a quarterback is, is getting, getting the Super Bowls and, and winning a Super Bowl. That's what really puts QBs in the Hall of Fame, so I don't think Philip Rivers will quite get in there, but he's a very good quarterback, and he, was, he started off slow the season, but he's playing very well, so I like that decision. It didn't work out, but I'm not going to say it led, you know, to the Bills getting a bunch of momentum that let them win the game, or it demoralized the Colts so much that they that they weren't able to recover, but too late. So I'm not one of those people. Anyways, but the one thing really that I, I thought was bad about the Colts was that last drive that the Colts had. It was, you know, they were down 27-24. They had the ball. Uh, after the kickoff, they had about two minutes, 30 seconds left uh, on the clock. Um, so you would think they would be, all they need is a field goal to tie the game. So you would think they would be able to move the ball down the field just a little bit better than what they were able to. I mean, you can use the middle of the field. You don't just have to throw to this, throw to the sidelines where the defense knows that you're trying to go, so they're going to defend that and and try to push you back into the middle of the field. You can use the middle of the field. You have plenty of time. You have the two-minute warning. You know, w- when you have to, you can you can clock the ball. So you have plenty of time. You can run 
your offense. You could even maybe once or twice you could you could run like if you if it was third down and short or fourth down and short and you needed and you needed to run you could do that and that would be okay as long as you're running your offense with a bit of urgency and and when you can get out of bounds you try and get out of bounds but <laughs> just that whole drive just it was just really bad it was just really bad clock management no urgency getting up to the getting up to the line of scrimmage after they completed passes. Receivers, when they caught the pass, not fighting to get out of bounds. Um, and they did run. They did run on a fourth and one uh, to pick it up. But then after the after the run, it took way too long to get into the next play. They, I mean, they were taking so long, they should have just spiked the ball just to get, you know, just to stop the clock. But it was just terrible clock management at the end of the game to the point where... <laughs> With what four, four or five seconds left, they were they were still only on, they were only at midfield. So it took them, it took them, two and a half minutes almost just to get twenty five yards down the field to the fifty yard line, and then on the last play, Philip Rivers can't even throw it into the end zone. He can't even throw it since he was since he was behind the line of scrimmage by a few yards. He threw it about. Oh, 53 yards. He couldn't even get it to the end zone. So even in the miracle situation that T.Y. Hilton had caught the ball, he would have still had to run past um, Bill's defenders to get into the end zone. So it was that play was, yeah. <laughs> Hail Marys have little chance of uh, working most of the time, and on that one it just basically had no chance. So... Yeah, it was it was a terrible end to the Colts season. I'm sure they felt like they should have won that game. Um, they were up. They let the Bills come back. The, they let the Bills' offense get rolling. Congratulations to the Bills. They are moving on to the divisional round. Uh, the next game on Saturday, uh, the Rams had a very impressive, very um, uh, I would say maybe surprising victory against the Seahawks, just in the way that they were able to completely dominate um, the Seahawks uh, with with uh, with their defense. You know, uh, they had five sacks, they had ten QB hits uh, against Russell Wilson. They held Russell Wilson to eleven of twenty-seven passing for 174 yards, and one of those was on a. <laughs> Crazy broken play where Russ Russ kept the play alive and and DK Metcalf got open because the play you know was broken was breaking down and I guess the cornerback I, I don't think it was Ramsey on that play although it might have been but they just kind of lost lost contact with him and he and he got open for that for that long touchdown but besides that play Russ had it, it was just a terrible day it was a game in which. Um, Seattle did have their starting uh, offensive lineup, so they had a couple guys I think injured, and they had so they had their starting uh, offensive lineup that they had at the beginning of the year. Those guys were all back, and it still didn't make a bit of difference. A very costly. Uh, Russ also threw a very costly interception uh, in the second quarter, I think. Um, on a wide receiver screen pass, which <laughs> that's a very safe throw to make. You you would not expect that to be intercepted um, by the cornerback, but um, a blown assignment by the receiver. He didn't get a, a good block on uh, Darius Williams. He and Darius Williams read the play exactly. He knew exactly what was going to happen, and he uh, yeah he just stepped in front and he. <laughs> dashed his way to the end zone and that put the Rams up 13-3 and um, from that point in the game the Rams basically they were their offense was always in a favor in a favorable situation so so during that game of course uh, John Walford he got injured he got hit um, by uh, uh, oh damn it Jamal Adams. He got he got injured on a hit by Jamal Adams. Looked like he had a concussion, possibly, or maybe a neck injury, something like that. He had he had to be taken off the field. 
put Goff back in, who just had thir- surgery on his thumb. Uh, he wasn't great, but he did get it done. But the big thing was the Rams are always in a favor- favorable position for their offense. They never, they never had to. They were never forced to make plays that they had to make, you know, in order to convert this first down, to keep this drive going, to to get this score. They they all, they were always able to run their offense the way that they wanted to, which in in this game meant. A lot of Cam Akers. Um, he had 131 yards uh, rushing, 45 receiving. Um, basically, they were able to minimize what they needed Jared Goff to do. He made a couple nice throws. Um, uh, he had a nice he had a nice throw to Cooper Cup, but he you know he was only um, nine of 19, 155 yards. He did have one touchdown, so that was nice. Um, but basically. They didn't need him to make a lot of throws. They didn't need him to extend a lot of drives. He just needed to do enough and to not make any mistakes. And the Rams were going to be able to win that game. And they were going to be able to win it easily because they completely... um, They just completely... Completely controlled the flow, the pace of the game, the the way Seattle wanted to play. Because, you know, Seattle... Um, generally is a under Pete Carroll been a been a run first team and then let Russell Wilson do his thing let Russell Wilson be efficient uh, make good throws especially on long throws he's really good he's a really good deep thrower because he's got a very good arm very accurate although he sometimes struggles I guess to see downfield because he's rather short for a QB anyways Seattle's offense wasn't able to do anything. You know, they sure they score a garbage touchdown at the very end, but this whole game, Aaron Donald was unblockable. Um, when he got hurt, uh, the guy that came in for him, whose name I can't remember, he was unblockable too. It didn't matter that they lost Aaron Donald. Leonard Floyd was amazing. Jalen Ramsey did this Jalen Ramsey thing, frustrating. DK Metcalf, uh, I'm sure if you were watching the game, you saw it. Uh, DK. As many a wide receiver will do, get very frustrated when he's not getting the ball. Um, yeah, Jalen Ramsey did his thing. He's probably the best corner in, in the NFL. The whole Rams defense played incredible. Um, they even looked like they got Russ a little uh, frustrated, and he's not—he's not the kind of QB who's uh, who gets frustrated who shows negative emotion like that on the field very often. There's a play, I think it was in the third quarter, where yeah, Russ drops back, you know, it was a pass play. He gets pressure up the middle. Um, his running back is sort of in the flat, but there's not really anything going on. Like, he doesn't have any blockers in front of him or anything. So Russ just bails on the play. He just throws the ball at the running back's feet, you know, incomplete. Um and you can just tell by like kind of his body language that he was really frustrated with that play because as soon as the ball was snapped to him, you know, Rams defense was giving him pressure. The play had no chance of working. It got blew up. Whatever the play was supposed to be, it had no chance of working. And you can just tell by like his body language and stuff that Russ was really frustrated uh, <laughs> with his offense, with the way the game was going. Whatever he was. He was frustrated at that point of the game, and it was just interesting because you usually don't see Russ get frustrated like that. I uh, I like to call him the uh, shonen protagonist of uh, NFL QBs. You know, he's always got a positive outlook. He's always looking at what might be done if everyone can just pull together and give their best and do all this kind of stuff. And he's never negative. He always thinks he can achieve <laughs> whatever he wants to achieve if he just gives the effort, just puts in the work, all that kind of stuff. He's total shonen protag. Anyways, I say that all to say, yeah, Russ, not the kind of guy to get frustrated. I'm not saying, you know, that that's what, you know, made the Seahawks lose or anything like that, or, or Russ lost his cool and, you know, he wasn't focused enough to, 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 get, to get his head back in the game, you know, to lead the Seahawks to a victory, anything like that. I'm just saying, uncharacteristically, the usually imperturbable, imperturbable, that's a very hard word to say. The normally imperturbable Russ was quite perturbed on that 
on that particular play. But um, yeah, congratulations to the Rams. They move on. So the last day on a Saturday, that would be the Washington football team taking on the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And of course, Tampa Bay won 21. I'm sorry. Tampa Bay won 31 to 23. Um, Taylor Heineke got the start for Washington, which um, uh, I guess they kind of kept under wraps. I mean, everyone was, I think, most people, I guess. <laughs> okay, maybe it's just me. I was expecting that, you know, even though Alex Smith clearly wasn't all the way healthy, that he was still going to get the start. He has playoff experience. He has a lot of regular season experience, playoff experience. Very experienced. He's a good QB, although he wasn't playing particularly well since he came back from his injury. But no, they go with uh, Taylor Heineke, who is, uh, I don't know, he's, what was he working, I guess, some regular job, and he was going to school, finishing up his degree at Old Dominion there. Um, he got the start. Um, he got the start for Washington going up against uh, Tom Brady, and um, he actually performed pretty well. Pretty well for his uh, first playoff game. So, um, the Bucks, yeah, their offense pretty pretty good. Brady was twenty two of forty for three hundred eighty one yards, two TDs. Uh, Leonard Fournette, there was a <laughs> Leonard Fournette sighting, uh, showing off that LSU power and speed. Uh, he had uh, ninety one yards and ninety one rushes, um, uh, a few receptions too. Um, yeah, it was a nice game. Uh, a little bit unexpected, I guess, maybe from Leonard Fournette, just because everyone's been, for good reason, been a little bit down on him with the way things uh, went down with uh, the Jags and, you know, uh, not being not being very good. He definitely, was, he definitely wasn't worthy of that top pick. Gosh, I can't remember what what the what the Jags selected him as, but he was, you know, very high first round pick. Uh, they didn't definitely did not get value for that. Uh, Mike Evans, he had 119 yards, even though he still looks like he's not right and you know, might have re-injured himself or something. Uh, he was good. Cameron Brait, the forgotten man at tight end, uh, what, what with uh, Rob Gronkowski being there, but uh, Cameron Brait had uh, four receptions for 80 yards. Uh, Antonio Brown also had a touchdown. Um yeah, the Bucks. Bucks just had a good offensive day. the The O line they mostly, um, they mostly kept the pockets clean for uh, Brady. I mean, he did get sacked a few times, but those were more the exception, not the rule. It, it wasn't like a lot of other times Brady, you know, was running for his life, uh, constantly with pressure, you know, from from the corners or up the middle. He he did get sacked, but most of the time he had clean pockets with with which to work and also just in the Bucks offense the way uh, the way Bruce Arians kind of runs things that it requires the quarterback you know to hold on to the ball a little longer to let his receivers get downfield because there's a lot of a lot of downfield passing in with Bruce Arians so that that probably also played a role in why they were able to sack him but overall they kept the pocket clean for Brady he the one thing they weren't particularly good at, though, was that there were there were a lot of res- wide receivers dr- dropping passes. Uh, Chris Godwin, too, after uh, the announcers had told us what great hands Chris Godwin had uh, from Tom Brady, um, uh, and they also weren't good in the red zone. Can you know converting converting trips to the to the red zone to touchdowns? They they did have to settle for a lot of field goals, so. That is that is one thing that the, that they weren't able to do all that well. Um, but for the football team, uh, Taylor Heineke, he was twenty six forty four for three hundred six yards. Um, he held up pretty well. Uh, Todd Bowles, the Tampa coordinator, likes to blitz a lot. Likes to uh, send the house at QBs and make them have to make a, a quick read or you know extend the play with their legs. And that's what it, that's what uh. Heineke was able to do. He was able to. He was able to use his feet a little. He had some nice scrambles. Um, when there was a blitz, he got the ball out quick to the open receiver. He he played pretty well. Um, he had a really nice pass in that 11-yard touchdown uh, to Steven Sims that put the game at 28-23 with about four minutes to go. Um, 
yeah, he held up pretty well, but um, the Bucks were able to they were able to seal the deal. They were able to chew up some time, get another field goal, uh, to get up 31-23, and then on the last Washington drive, they get pressure on Heineke. They sack him on third down, and then on fourth down, you know, incomplete. So the Bucks win the game. So nice for them. I, their offense played well, but I think they'll have to be a little more efficient if they hope uh, they hope to uh, get past their opponent in the divisional round, which was to be determined after this game. So now let's go to Sunday's game. So first game on Sunday, that would be the uh, Baltimore Ravens taking on the Tennessee Titans, and Baltimore gets a close victory, twenty-three to thirteen. Um, Lamar. This game was very much dominated by Lamar, which is uh, kind of funny, um, just because the stat line in passing, anyways, you know, it was only 17 to 24 for 189 yards and one touchdown. But um, his running—that's always the thing with Lamar. You can't look at just his passing. It's definitely that his running ability. That's that what that's what makes him great. Uh, he had 16 uh, rushes for 136 yards and. That uh, 48-yard touchdown there in the second quarter that um, everyone has probably seen, talk, talked about. Uh, he made the uh, <laughs> he made he made the Titans' de- defense, uh, especially their secondary, just look slow. You know, th- that's the best way to put it. When uh, Lamar turns on those Jets, there is no catching him. But um, yeah, this was a, very much a game that was that Baltimore controlled the game because of what Lamar was able to do with his legs. Um, I actually kind of felt that uh, the Tennessee defense, I mean, overall, I mean, they did give up a lot of yards. They gave up, like, over 400 yards. I think they had, I think uh, Baltimore had 401 yards. But, hey, they only gave up 20 points. So as far as that, as far as that went, they did, they did do okay in limiting the amount of points because Tennessee's defense has been garbage <laughs> pretty much all year so the fact that they were only able to give up 20 points that was a good thing however um they weren't good on third downs because um baltimore is able to convert seven of 13 uh, third downs uh baltimore had the ball for about 33 and a half minutes um they ran 64 plays to tennessee's 49 so the defense they did okay and and holding ten, uh, Baltimore um, to 20 points and um, not giving up too many big plays uh, to Baltimore to break open the game, but not so great on third downs, not so great on giving their offense more chances um, to score. Uh, Baltimore running game, obviously very impressive. Uh, Lamar, like I said, he, he was he was their leading rusher. Um Gus Edwards, J.K. Dobbins, they all they all pitched in. They had 236 yards on the ground, so that's kind of how they were able to control the game. Um, for Tennessee, though, um, I think kind of their failure in this game offensively was the refusal after it was kind of clear that it wasn't working. They kept trying to run, especially on first down, so... Uh, Derrick Henry, um, he ended the game. He had 18 runs for 40 yards. He was he was a non-factor in the game. Now, of course, the thing with the Titans is Henry's he's probably the most important player on offense, just because because of how good individually he is, and also that they can kind of control the flow of the game. They can use play action off of successful running. Um, he wasn't able to get going, but they kept with the running on first down with Henry you know getting one yard two yards or losing yards which sets up obvious passing downs which Baltimore knows and they can scheme for and they can shut down and basically the refusal to give up running on first down kind of made the Tennessee offense more predictable which made it easier um, for Baltimore to defend because I mean uh, Ten- Tennessee's got they've they've got a lot of weapons um, on offense, but their offense was held to I think it was under like 250 total yards for the game. Like Tannehill, he only had 165 yards passing. He had a touchdown. He had a pick. 
Um, A.J. Brown, he played well. He, he had something like 80 yards receiving. Um, no one else really on the Tennessee receiving core kind of stepped up. Um, Corey Davis, he didn't even play the fourth quarter. I believe there was an like undisclosed injury. I know Mike Verbo, the head coach, talked about it after afterwards the game. I don't, I don't think he gave any specifics on what the injury was, but some kind of in, injury affected Corey Davis, which is unfortunate because although he had he has been somewhat of a bust given that he was their first round pick uh, in 2016 high draft pick hasn't quite lived up to expectations but he is having a really good year in a contract year which is very important he wasn't able to go out there be himself he didn't even play the fourth quarter that really hurt to not have their second best receiver out there one more thing about Tennessee so there was (laughs) people were talking about um, it being a cowardly decision uh by Mike Vrabel to punt um, there in the fourth quarter, so it was it was it was fourth down, I believe it was fourth and two. Tennessee had the ball at their own forty. Ten minutes left in the fourth quarter. Uh, they're down in the game. They decide to punt the ball back to Baltimore. So, yes, people kind of calling this a cowardly move, which. Uh, for one, <laughs> when did it? it I'm, it's strange to me to that all of a sudden NFL Twitter, the NFL intelligentsia, referring to his head coaching decisions as cowardly, and I don't know. I've just that seems to be a phrase that has just recently popped up and uh, has has become um, something something used a lot and in discussion and analysis the NFL I just thought that was weird because <laughs> I'd never heard it until like gosh starting like a few years ago well, when a, when a coach makes a bad decision usually when it's when it's to punt the ball instead of going from forward on fourth that it's a cowardly decision anyways so that was you know that was a definitely a point of contention of contention should Bra- Vrabel have punted the ball in that situation why not give your offense a chance to continue the drive keep the ball not ask your defense to get another stop just yeah go go for it on fourth down that situation let your offense try and win the game rather than relying on your defense to make a stop to help your to give your offense another chance myself I don't have a big problem with punting on that situation you're your offense, your running game wasn't working. Um, you would like to think your passing game could make that work because Tannehill, although he's not he's not a burner uh, as far as his speed, he he was a receiver when he was at uh, A and M his first two years. He converted quarterback. He moves well in the pocket. He he can make plays with his feet outside the pocket. He's not you know a stiff out there. Um, and they also they have a pretty good receiving tight end in Johnny Smith. I'd like to think he could, you know, run some kind of quick out and just use his big body to box out, you know, the corner or, or safety, whoever would be matched up against them. Uh, you know, I'd hope that Tennessee has a play on like a fourth and short, a passing play that they feel comfortable running in that situ- situation. That said, I myself, I didn't have a big problem with it. Punt the ball, try and pin Baltimore back. Baltimore's offense, yeah, you've you haven't been so great on third down, but you're not giving up a lot of points. Let your defense let your defense try and get another stop. Live to fight another day. Don't give Baltimore good field position where they're already almost in scoring position. So myself, I don't know. I, I didn't think it was that bad a decision there by Mike Vrabel not to go for it on fourth. Anyways, Baltimore goes on to win. They kick a field. They, they're up 17-13. They kick a field goal, go up 20-13. Uh, Tennessee, you know, desperation drive. Tannehill throws an interception. Baltimore wins. Lamar Jackson gets his first playoff victory of what perhaps will be many. Uh, nice for nice for the Ravens to get a uh, playoff win. They move on. Second game on Sunday, uh, Bears versus the Saints. I'm not going to talk about this game a lot. I I did watch it, um, but it was 
I wouldn't say it was a pleasant experience, although I don't have Nickelodeon, so I didn't get to watch the Nickelodeon broadcast of the game, and apparently that would have made the game a lot more fun. Um, anyways, yeah, there, there's not a, a lot to say about this game. The Bears, they had a small opportunity there um, to make it interesting. Um, it was kind of a trick play, a, what, it was a handoff to, or it was a toss, I think, to toss to, to a receiver, um, toss to a receiver who tossed it back to Trubisky, um, so, you know, it's kind of a flea flicker. They had a they had a receiver, Javon Wims, wide open. It, it would have been a touchdown. Trubisky throws a good pass, does a, does a very good pass to a wide open receiver, and the wide receiver just he doesn't actually he doesn't even drop it because it it didn't hit his hands. It just went through, it went through his hands. That uh, that uh, I guess it's kind of a triangle that kind of your hands make when you when you go up for a pass and you. And and you try to catch it like that, how your hands like sort of make a, sort of make a triangle. It just goes through his arms, incomplete pass. <laughs> that was pretty much the Bears' chance to make the game interesting. At that point, the game would have been seven to seven. Hey, it's still a game. Bears defense was playing okay. okay. Um, who knows what would have happened? But um, no, that doesn't happen. They don't get a touchdown. They, I think, they score a field goal at some point in the first half. But yeah, this this game, it was it was never past that point. It was never really in contention. Um, Breeze looked pretty good. He was twenty eight to thirty nine, two TDs. Kamara had ninety nine yards, a touchdown. Uh, they held the Bears. The, the The Saints defense played well, but then again, it is the Bears. So yeah, they held them two hundred thirty nine yards and. An amazing one for ten on third downs. That, I will admit, that's impressive. Um, so yeah, Bears lose. They're done. Where do the Bears go from now? Um, are they going to keep Mitchell Trubisky? I would say. I would say they either need to trade for a QB. <laughs> Is that Matt Stafford? Is that a reclamation project like Sam Darnold? I don't know. Or use a draft pick to get a QB. Although probably the top four QBs will be will be gone by the time the by the time the Bears uh, draft. So I don't know what they got to do, but I would say probably they need to move on to Trubisky. It's it's not going to get any better. Move on. Cut your losses. It was <laughs> very unfortunate for them to make that pick to trade up to get Trubisky, but uh, yeah, it hasn't worked out for them. They're done. Saints move on. The Saints move on to the divisional round. So now, for the final game on Sunday was Cleveland Browns. Now, I picked this game. They were they were my one upset pick. I think I had for the uh, for the wild card week. I thought Cleveland was going to be able to win, although I had no idea it was going to happen in this fashion. Five Pittsburgh <laughs> turnovers, uh, four interceptions by by Big Ben. Uh, fumble. I mean, I I guess is that Big Ben. I mean, it was it was off a of, it was a terrible snap. So I, I don't know who they give the fumble to. If that was Marquise Pouncey, was the I mean, it was a bad snap. It was Marquise Pouncey's fault for for the fumble. Anyways, five Pittsburgh uh, turnovers just <laughs> from the very moment on that first Pittsburgh drive when uh, bad snap. Cleveland recovers it in the end zone, gets a touchdown. They race out um, thanks to some more Big Ben bad plays, some interceptions, doinking off a Cleveland player. Well, one of them, a Cleveland defender, got his arm up on the pass and ball went up in the air and intercepted it. But anyways, Ben was terrible from the start. Cleveland gets up 28-0 to in the first quarter. Uh, after that point, they kind of tapped the brakes a little on their offense, played a little more conservatively, you know, just trying to <laughs> run out the clock. But, um, yeah, Cleveland wins 48-35. Interesting that uh, <laughs> if you were just looking at some of the, if you had no context on the game whatsoever and you just looked at some of the offensive stats, you would say, wow, the Pittsburgh offense was great today. They were Eight of fifteen on third down. They had they held the ball almost thirty three minutes. They were 
four 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 um, in scoring position in the red zone. They had 553 yards. That's a pretty great offensive day, but um, that is why you don't look at offensive numbers in isolation. You gotta you gotta look at the whole context of the game. Um, yeah, those a lot of yards when they had to pass, had to come back. Um, Cleveland was, you know, especially in the second half, the Cleveland was definitely definitely had their had had their foot off the gas for for a while there. Um, although I will say, once Pittsburgh cut the lead to thirty five to twenty three, I bet there were some Browns fans who were just a little bit concerned that that Pittsburgh was going to come was going to come back was going to pull off a miracle comeback. And maybe win that game. I'm not saying it was. There was a big probability that was going to happen, but maybe just a little bit. Browns fans, just just level with me that you thought maybe Pittsburgh could come back, but they did not. Um, Cleveland, uh, they're able to score. Uh, Nick Chubb. Nick Chubb had a nice uh, reception, 40-yard touchdown. Cleveland goes back up 42-23, and at that point, the game. I was I was sure that at that point in the game, the game was over. Cleveland's going to win. Um, yeah, so impressive performance by the Cleveland offense. Um, 124 yards rushing for Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt. Baker was good. Jarvis Landry showing off those Jets with a 40-yard uh, touchdown reception. I mean, seriously, Jarvis Landry, he's not exactly known as uh, one of the speediest receivers in the league. And he uh, he looked pretty fast on his uh, touchdown reception, so good for him. Um, not much more to say about this game other than that. Oh, sorry, forgot. Another possibly cowardly <laughs> uh, punt, uh, this time by the uh, Sealers. So fourth and one on their own 46 at the beginning of the fourth quarter. At that point, it was 35-23. Steelers hadn't been running the ball well that game, just like the whole season. Their, their, running, their running offense was not very good. So, And also, they'd stopped Cleveland three times. They'd, they'd forced three Cleveland punts um, up to that point in the second half. So their defense had been playing a little better, although... I mean, you would expect at some point that Cleveland was probably going to be able to score. So just because there was a, you know that nice trend of three straight stops, that doesn't necessarily mean you could expect that trend to continue, that Cleveland wasn't going to be able to get at least one drive in the second half that would lead to points. That would probably put the game out of reach. So in this case, given how far behind Pittsburgh was and just what they needed to happen. Basically, <laughs> Pittsburgh had to be perfect in the second half, and Cleveland just had to completely be inept on offense the entire second half in order for Pittsburgh to win. Yeah, okay, in that case, yeah, I think Pittsburgh should have been should have been more willing to uh, go for it on fourth down one and see if they could continue that drive, you know. Shoot, they could have even gone for a field goal at that point. I mean, that, that would have made the game, what, well, no, actually, never mind. No, they would not have gone for a field goal there. Still try and give yourself a chance, get a touchdown, make the game interesting. Yeah, in that case, I'm not going to call <laughs> uh, Mike Tomlin cowardly, but I will say, yeah, and that at that point of the game, you should probably have gone for the fourth down. So uh, hopefully they learned something with that. So Pittsburgh loses. This is possibly the end of an era in Pittsburgh. Um Big Ben, he's <laughs> was not a good season for him. Um, next year's salary cap, um, uh, and these these numbers are from Over the Cap, so that's a website. Anyways, they predict that the Steelers, because I, I should just say what the cap number for 2021 is isn't known at this time. So uh, Over the Cap, their prediction is that the Steelers will be $21 million over the cap for 2021. So that means <laughs> they're going to have to cut some players. Uh, Big Ben has a forty-one million dollar cap hit in 2021, but they can get nineteen million of dollars of cap savings if they make uh, Big Ben a 
uh, what is it, a pre-June 1 cut. So if they cut them before June 1, they can save $19 million. That might very well be a possibility, given the way that he played. So, again, we could be looking at the end of an era in Pittsburgh as they have to move on from Ben Roethlisberger into a unknown future with, hey, is it going to be Josh Dobbs? I don't know if he's even still on the team. Is it going to be... Um, Mason Rudolph, is it going to be a QB that they draft or trade for? Who knows? But we could have looked at Big Ben's last game in the NFL. So uh, happy trails to him for quite the career. And with that, uh, the divisional round is set up. So let's go to the picks for the divisional round. So first up on Saturday, uh, the Rams versus the Packers. Now, the Rams offense, um, me, I don't think they're going to be able to keep up with a uh, very in sync, a clicking Green Bay uh, offense. Although uh, the, the loss of David Bakhtiari, um, Green Bay's uh, tackle, in week 16 to an ACL injury. So, you know, he's gone the rest of the postseason. That definitely could be a factor because he is going up against a good uh, defensive front for the Rams. But we don't fully know, you know, the extent of Aaron Donald's injury and, and how that's going to affect him and I'm assuming he is going to play in the game but we don't know how much how much he's going to be able to give what percent of his full capacity he's going to play at I just don't think I just don't think the Rams are going to be able to score enough I don't think the Packers are going to make a bunch of mistakes um, I think they're going to be able to protect Aaron Rodgers better than what Seattle was able to protect Russell Wilson I just don't see the Rams being able to make enough plays in offense to keep up with Green Bay. Give me Green Bay 27-17. Second game Saturday is Ravens and Bills. Uh, it's Lamar uh, versus Josh Allen. Uh, both QBs taken in the 2018 draft. Very Well, in Josh Allen's case, he was a high draft pick. Lamar, he was into the uh, first round, but still. Lamar versus Josh Allen, or what I like to call um, Lamar versus Super Saiyan Lamar. Because to me, Josh Allen in a lot of ways is the ascended form of Lamar Jackson. All right, what's one thing that Lamar Jackson struggles with? Well, it's his accuracy. That was the case with Josh Allen. He definitely struggled with his accuracy his first two years, but this year... He's been a lot more accurate. He's been a very accurate passer. He's he's throwing guys open. He's he's making use of the weapons that he has. He's making, you know, Stephon Diggs look like an all-pro. He's making, heck, he's making Cole Beasley almost look like an all-pro. Cole Beasley's a very good slot receiver, but um, Josh Allen, he's definitely... <laughs> Whatever he did in the offseason is definitely working because his accuracy is a lot better. The Bills' offense is a lot better than it was last year. He's fixed his, fixed his accuracy problems. Lamar's still struggling with that. Um, Josh Allen has a rocket arm just like Lamar. They can both make all the throws. There's no question that they have plenty of arm strength. They both make plays with their feet. Now, of course, Josh Allen is not as fast as Lamar Jackson. Um, uh, Josh Allen ran like a 4.7540 um, at the combine. That's very good for a QB. That's very good. But Lamar ran like a 4.3 something or other. A lot faster, but they can both make plays with their feet. There's plenty of examples of Josh Allen scrambling uh, to pick up first downs, making big plays, or just extending plays, get out of pressure, or move the pocket a little bit so he can make a throw. So. They both have the mobility, the elusiveness that the modern QB uh, needs. They both got the arm strength, but Lamar has, or sorry, Josh Allen has figured out how to improve his accuracy, and as a result, um, I just like the Bills a little bit more um, in this game than I do the Ravens. Uh, Ravens defense, very good. They had a good game plan against Tennessee. They were able to hold them down. I don't think they're going to be able to do that to the Bills. I think this is going to be a very close game, but in the end, give me the Bills 28 to 27 to move on to the AFC Championship. All right, Sunday. First game Sunday is Chiefs versus Browns, and this is my upset special. So I am picking the Cleveland Browns 
to win 34-31. They're able to run the ball. They're able to control the clock. They're able to use play action opportunistically. So Baker, he's going to have a good day. He's going to get it to Jarvis Landry. He's going to give it to um, David Njoku. He's going to get it to what is it? Donovan Peoples-Jones. Um, who else? His guys out of the backfield, Chubb and Kareem Hunt, all those guys. He's going to be able to get it working. They get Denzel Ward, their starting cornerback. Um, he's back from being off on, a, I think, COVID protocols. Same with Joel, Pato- Joel Batonio, their guard. Both of them return. They got most of their team. Of course, they have their head coach back, Kevin Stefanski. Um, yes, I am... That is what I'm going with. Cle- Cleveland puts off, pulls off amazing upset, a humbling defeat for Patrick Mahomes. Uh, rather like Stain in My Hero Academia, where he was uh, defeated by three, you know, UA students, but he was defeated by uh, Ida, uh, Midoriya, and Todoroki. Very humiliating defeat for you know such a feared villain to be be defeated by three you know amateur heroes still in training very unfortunate for him likewise this is going to be a humbling defeat for the Chiefs and Patrick Mahomes after sort of down the stretch they look like they weren't all that engaged all that interested in some of the games that they were able to win humbling experience for them they'll move forward they'll be fine going ahead um I'm just going to go out on a limb here and say I think Mahomes will win another Super Bowl, but it is not going to be this year. Cleveland wins 34-31. How do you like that? Final game, um, final playoff game on this divisional weekend, Tampa versus New Orleans. I know New Orleans defeated uh, Tampa twice this year, looking very impressive in both in both victories. This time, however... I think Tom Brady gets his revenge. Uh, I guess if revenge is the right word on on Drew Brees, I don't think Drew Brees is fully back from those from those. Uh, his ribs aren't fully he- healed from that hit he took, you know, a month month and a half ago. Um, I think that the Bucks defensive uh, their defensive front. So Indomitian Sue, Shaq Barrett, Jason Pierre, Paul, those guys, they're going to be able to get pressure on Brees. Um, Michael Thomas, he's probably still not 100%. Alvin Kamara is going to get his yards. He's going to be effective. But really, it's going to be the pressure on Breeze that's going to that's going to lead. Um, the New Orleans offense not being as effective as it was. And I think the Tampa Bay offense getting you know kind of stymied two times by the New Orleans defense because that's a very good New Orleans defense. And to be honest, uh, I'm not going to say they're carrying New Orleans, but early with Drew Brees' run, this was very, very much was the offense that was the engine of the team. I, I kind of think you're, we're leaning in this, these past few years where um, New Orleans sort of rebuilt their defense. They <laughs> got rid of Rob Ryan as their defensive coordinator. That was definitely a good move. Anyways, it's been more of a team that relies on its defense and the defense has been very good but I think the Tampa Bay offense just with all those weapons they got those first playoff game jitters out of the way Uh, some of you know some of their players that was the first playoff game they've ever been in got those out of the way with their offense is going to figure out the New Orleans defense deep passing game they're going to get going. They're going to be able to protect Brady long enough. He's going to be able to get the ball downfield. Tampa Bay offense pulls away from New Orleans. Tampa wins 35-24. They go to the NFC Championship game. Those are my predictions. We'll see how they turn out. I'm hoping for another exciting and entertaining playoff weekend in the NFL. So now we've arrived at that time of the show where we call upon our, our good friend Sharaz Nobel, the, uh, the Red Comet himself, to start up that Zaku of his, you know, fire up that Manovsky fusion reactor, because we are going to go around the sports world three times faster. One of them is approaching us at three times normal speed. 
You said it, Federation Helmsman. Three times faster. Three times normal speed. Incredible. All right. For our first stop. All right. For our first stop to the world of golf. How about that? So this past weekend was the first tournament of the year for the PGA Tour, the Century Tournament Tournament of Champions in Maui, Hawaii. Um, lovely weather there. I, I wish I was in Hawaii right now. I'm not a fan of the cold, of winter, all that stuff. Even some sort of some snow the other day. Not a fan. Anyways, uh, Harris English wins. Um, actually had to go to a playoff. Um, so him and Joaquin Neiman uh, tied it. They were both uh, minus 25, but they did a playoff thing. Uh, Harris English uh, got a birdie. Uh, Joaquin Neiman did not. So, yeah, Harris English is your winner. Um, some other names of note. Uh, Justin Thomas was third. He was back 24. Bryson uh, DeChambeau, he was uh, tied at seventh at uh, minus 20. Dustin Johnson and Sergio Garcia tied at 11th. Um, they were back 18 strokes to finish the tournament. Very exciting if you're a golf fan, I'm sure. All right. On we go to the world of women's soccer. Very interesting. Um, the National Women's Soccer League, uh, you may not know if it exists. It, it is on uh, TV. I believe it's on, their games are on ESPN2. I believe. Anyways, they had a draft. Um, they had a draft recently, and with the number two pick in the draft, the Washington Spirit selected Trinity Rodman, the daughter of a um, very famous NBA star and <laughs> sometimes uh, airsats international diplomat Dennis Rodman. So that's his daughter, 18 years old. She was supposed to play at Washington State this year, but Due to COVID, canceled the season, so she never got to play in college. But good enough to be the number two pick in a, in in the draft. That's very nice for her. I'm assuming her name is a you know that's throwback reference, a tip of the hat to Trinity from the Matrix, which makes me feel very old because I remember going in as a teenager. I forget how old I was. Maybe I was 15. When the first Matrix movie came out, seeing it in the theaters, it makes me very, makes me feel very old, very sad that uh, I'm old enough now that people who named their children after Trinity are now themselves adults. So very troubling uh, to think that I'm old. Very nice for the Rodman family. Uh, very nice for Trinity Rodman. She's selected second. She's going to be playing for the Washington Spirit. Does that move the needle for you? Does, does that make you a little interested to watch the uh, National Women's Soccer League? I gotta admit that that makes me a little interested. I think I might I think I might check it out just to see what she does. So very interesting for them. Um, I'm sure they'll get somewhat of a ratings bump at least at the beginning of the se of the season to see what Trinity Rodman can do. All right, last stop, our last stop on this great journey around the sports world. We turn to uh, the MLB, but specifically uh, to baseball cards. So a Mickey Mantle uh, 1952 card, uh, Tops, autographed by Mantle himself, sold for $5.2 million. Uh, this was a mint nine grade, so that's not the highest uh, like quality uh, condition that a card can be rated at. Uh, 10 is the highest. That's mint condition. This is almost mint. It's 9. It's it's very close to being up there. But um, yes, that's the most that any baseball card has ever been sold for. $5.2 million. I forget the collector's name. He's some guy who's spent a lot of money on uh, baseball cards. I wish I had that much money to spend on, on, uh, on cards. I don't I just got back into collecting football cards after not doing it for like 20 years. I wish some of my cards were worth just a little bit more than what I thought they would be. I'm kind of disappointed to find out that all the cards that I thought might be worth something. No, they're not worth anything. Anyways, how nice for him. How nice for the... I, th I think that the card itself was like a, owned by, you know, some company or something. It wasn't owned by, you know, like just a private person that... Now all of a sudden is a millionaire. No, it was some company or something. They had this card like in their 
somewhere in their vaults or wherever they're storing all their all of the cards and which is amazing that you know that that card was in such good condition i mean mint grade for a card from 1952 that's very good condition how nice for them how nice for the guy to spend 5.2 million dollars on a freaking piece of paper <laughs> with a picture and some stats on the back uh, very 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 interesting the world of card collecting maybe we can get into that topic at some point in another episode but for now um thank you to char he can you can leave us right here we'll, we'll find our way back home that is our trip around the sports world three times faster now to our final segment for this episode, this is going to be a new segment that I promised at the beginning of this episode. So what I'd like to do in this segment is to tip our toes into the water of sports statistics and metrics so that we can all become better uh, sports fans, better consumers of sports, have a, have a little bit of a more educated opinion in the way that we watch sports, and so um, I'd say most importantly, so we can use statistics and metrics so that we can better understand a player's contribution uh, to the overall team effort. So what what I'd like to do for these segments is I'll just pick one you know statistic or metric, I'll give a little background on it, what it's trying to explain or to quantify a player's um, performance, and then highlight the strengths and the weaknesses of that statistic or metric. All in the all in the goal of pursuing a enlightened discussion, a healthy exchange of ideas between sports fans. So yeah, hopefully some of these maybe you're not so familiar with, and in whatever way that I'm able to, I can share some of my knowledge with you, um, and we can both grow as sports fans. Isn't that lovely? So for today, the statistic that I'd like to look at, well. Let's call it a metric because it combines a bunch of other statistics. So the one that I'd like to look at today is the player efficiency rating that's used in basketball. Um, so this uh, metric was developed by John Hollinger. He was a writer for Sports Illustrated for ESPN. He's currently at the, at the Athletic. It's hard to say. And he was uh, part of the Memphis Grizzlies front office. So what this... And it's probably best to call it a metric because it combines a bunch of pretty much all of the um, traditional box score statistics that you'll find in basketball, like points, rebounds, steals, um, free throws, blocks, those kinds of things. It combines them all. It does some <laughs> some fancy little math. Um, and what it's doing is it's measuring a player's overall contribution to the team by taking the positive statistics that he contributes, like his points, rebounds, and steals, and subtracting some of their negative statistics, like how many turnovers they commit or the missed shots. And then it controls for the pace of play and how many minutes a particular player plays in order to get a more, a more accurate estimate. Um, we could call it the causal impact of a player on the game. So what do I mean by pace of play? That just means how many possessions in a game does a team typically have. So some teams can be more up-tempo teams that play an up-tempo style of offense. They're going to have more possessions in the game. So that means there's going to be more opportunities for all the players to gather you know, statistics. They're going to have more opportunities to shoot the ball, to rebound, to steal, also to have turnovers, commit fouls, those kinds of things. But that means that players who play in um, offenses that are slower tempo are penalized because their teams average less possessions per game, so there's less opportunities for them to pile up statistics. So you're not really comparing apples to apples if you just look at the raw points or rebounds or steals that a player contributes. You, you, you want to look at it from a per-possession um, from a per possession perspective in order to see what the player how the player is contributing per possession in the game so that's what's meant by controlling for the pace of play that we don't want to look just at the raw stats we want to make sure that we're looking at um, 
the estimated impact that a player has on each possession of the game. And now controlling for minutes, well that just means m controlling for the number of minutes that a player gets because obviously <laughs> players who get more time, who get more playing time are going to have more opportunities to contribute statistics to the team. Again, this it 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 doesn't exactly follow closely with um with pace of play. I mean, they're different things, but the idea controlling for them is the same. Is that we want to be comparing a player's contribution in a similar manner. We don't want to penalize one player for not being on the floor and not able to contribute to the team. We want to be able to say when this player is on the floor, this is what um, this is how they can impact the game. So after all that, all, all that whole big long formula is calculated using all these box score statistics, the last thing that's done um, to the rating to make it into the PER rating that we all know is that it's normalized so that the average PER rating um, of a player in a particular season is 15. So a 15 would be just an average player in the NBA. Um, a player with a PER of, say, under 10, uh, they're not going to be in the league very long. They'll be in the development league or they'll probably be out of basketball. Um, a player with a PER of 20, that's a pretty good player. That's a pretty good start. That's maybe your second or third scoring option on a good team. A PER of 25, now that's, that's an all-star or borderline all-star kind of performer. And then a PER of 30 or above is just, that's, that's an MVP type player. That's, that's getting up there. If a player can average 30, 30 P in PER in a season, that's, you know, that's a very impressive, very perhaps even a historically great um, performance in the season that a, player, that a player's done. If they can average 30 PER in a season, that's incredible. So that's, that's kind of kind of how to interpret the ratings like that's kind of the scale on which to grade um, a player's PER how, how you can how you can think about it it's just probably actually the most important thing is just to know that it's normalized so that 15 is average so the strengths I think of this metric or thou are that as I mentioned it controls for pace of play and a player's minutes in a game so, we're, so we can compare apples to apples when we're looking at different players. Um, and the fact that it also tries to take into account both the positive and negative statistics that a player has in order to get a feel for what overall they're doing on, a, on the court. So it's good that it, that it also looks at defensive statistics and not just offense. Some of the weaknesses with PER are that it uh, it tends to undervalue um, defensive statistics, um, in as much as the fact that it relies on the traditional defensive statistics like steals or blocks, they don't really capture a player's full value on defense because there's a lot of there's a lot of things that a player can do defensively, both as an individual and as part of a team that help the team play good defense, but that traditional box score stati statistics aren't capturing. So um, think of it as communication. Communication in basketball is key to being able to play good defense, to, to know if uh, a player behind you is about to set a pick on you, whether you should go under or over the pick, uh, when to rotate to, a, to defend another player, um, those kinds of things. That takes a lot of good communication, everyone being on the same page. So players who are good at recognizing this, at communicating with their teammates to get them in good positions, that's going to be a good defensive player, but there's not really a way to quantify what they're doing. So traditional defensive statistics, they're not telling the whole story about how much a player contributes to the defense of a team and how and how valuable that contribution is. So um, there are like more there are like more advanced kind of dis defensive statistics, not 
holistic in the way that PER tries to be, but, but they try to look like it fine-grained, very detailed, I guess, situational kind of defensive statistics, like how good is a player guarding in the post? How good are they guarding the three-point line, the two-point line? How good are they defending from the free throw line to the to the basket? Those kind of things that are trying to capture a little with a little more detail what a player does defensively. So so that's one weakness with PER. Another weakness could be um, that it doesn't value all of the things that an offensive player uh, brings because it doesn't value the quality of shots that a that a player is able to get for other players. So. You can think of a player like LeBron. Think of all the good shots that he gets for his other teammates. Even necessarily that, um, even if they don't make them, if they were still open shots that they were able to get because LeBron draws a lot of attention and he's a good passer. He knows how to you know, attack the rim, get into the paint, pass to an open guy when there's an open guy and he knows that he can't finish at the rim. So he's good at that. So it... It tends to undervalue just everything that a player does um, to help his teammates be able to get better shots. So it undervalues playmaking. So overall, overall PER is a pretty good. It's a pretty good estimate of the offensive production uh, that a player brings to the team. Like if you if you just stack up who have had historically great um, seasons. Um, with their PER rating, it's going to be the players that most people agree those are some of the best players in the league of all time, like Michael Jordan, LeBron, Kobe, um, Bob Cousy, Wilt Chamberlain, um, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Dirk Nowitzki. Um, lots of players like those. They've had some of the best uh, seasons for uh, PER, the best careers. Um, they're career PER rating is is among the best so it it lines up pretty well with who we think of are the best players of all time particularly on offense but it's it's not so great at capturing defensive uh, the defensive contributions that a player makes so so it's it's a good statistic to uh, just just know about have a have a little bit of understanding about it it's it's been around for quite a while i don't think it's going anywhere um, it's not perfect um, you don't want to over rely on it, or just only look at PER when you're when you're trying to determine how how well a player um, plays, how how much they actually contribute to their team. But it's definitely a good one to know and then to uh, show off with when you're discussing uh, the finer points of basketball with your you know friends, family members, people on the internet, whoever you can you can you can definitely impress them if you start breaking out with PER rating. Assuming they aren't also, you know, big into statistics and sports metrics and can bat down your arguments easily. So as long as you don't run into a person like that, you'll do fine. So it's an interesting mes- metric to understand about basketball. And with that, we have reached the end of the show. I'd like to thank you for listening uh, to today's episode. As always, you can find us on Podbean and on YouTube once I upload this to YouTube. If you want to get in contact with us, you can definitely do that across a wide variety of social media. So on YouTube, you can just find our channel. It's the 28 House. On Twitter, it's at the underscore 28 House. On Instagram, it's at the 28 House. We're on Twitch, although we haven't used it in a while. Uh, that's the underscore 28 underscore House. We're also on Facebook. Um, I think if you just type in the 28 house, you'll you'll find our Facebook page. But I think like if you do it like with an, you can do it as at the real 28 house because I think someone else had at the 28 house. So you can find us that way on Facebook or email. So you can email us. We always love email. So 28 spelled out so t-w-o-e-i-g-h-t house at gmail.com so 28 house at gmail.com and 28 are spelled out so give us any comments criticisms uh, suggestions for segments topics anything else you want to see or maybe a suggestion for um, a sports anime series you want to see me watch and review because i am going to do that that is definitely upcoming um, thank you again for listening 
I appreciate it. We will see you next week. And so long and farewell. And uh, Rick, take it away. Adios, mofo.